This week marks six months since the October 7th attack on Israel by the terrorist organization Hamas. More than 1,200 Israelis were murdered, thousands were injured, and 240 people were taken hostage. 23-year-old Hirsch Goldberg Poland was one of the hostages taken by Hamas, and he remains in captivity today. His parents, John Poland and Rachel Goldberg, have spent every waking minute since trying to bring Hirsch home. John and Rachel, it's so nice to be with you. I'm so sorry it's under such difficult, excruciating circumstances. I know it's been about six months since Hirsch was kidnapped. I think it's hard to imagine, honestly, what you all have been going through. Tell me what life looks like for you right now. Well, exactly as you said, so many people say to us, we can't imagine what you're going through. And frankly, we always say we can't imagine what we're going through. Um, as you mentioned, I mean, every day we change the number. It's been 181 days since October 7th. Um, and we kissed Hirsch goodbye on the evening of October 6th before he left to go to the Nova Music Festival with his best friend. And um, he turned around in the doorway very casually as he was leaving. And he said to me, love you, see you tomorrow. And that was 182 nights ago. Um, so we, when you ask, you know, what this is like, and we live on a different planet, truly. We wake up every morning and we put on, I always say, I put on this costume of a human so that I can and John can run to the ends of the earth and turn over every possible stone to try to save Hirsch's life and the other 133 hostages who are still being held to save anyone who is who is still alive and to bring back those who we know already are confirmed dead. And it is an unimaginable, excruciating, ongoing, slow motion trauma. John, I even hate to ask you this because I hate to have you relive that horrible day, the chaos, the horror, the confusion, but I think it speaks to what you all had to endure and what you continue to endure all these days later. Can you take us back to trying to figure out what had happened on that day? Sure. So on the morning of October 7th, Saturday morning, so the Jewish Sabbath, and it also coincided with the holiday, I was up early and left the house by 7.30 for synagogue in Jerusalem, where we live. Um, the perspective that I went through at synagogue is probably shortly after 8 o'clock, the first air raid siren went off, which is super rare in Jerusalem. And the group, the group of us who was there at that time went into the bomb shelter of the building. Um, we were in there for 10 minutes or so. We came out. A few minutes later, the next siren went. And this cycle continued for a little while. Um, ultimately, after about an hour, we canceled services and everybody went home. And when I got home, Rachel said, we have a problem. There was obviously a big problem in the country, but... She had turned on her phone, which we, we normally don't use on the Jewish Sabbath, and seen two text messages that we came in from Hirsch at 8.11 in the morning to a, a group that the three of us have together. The first message said, I love you. And the second message immediately afterwards said, I'm sorry. So when you get messages like that from a son who had just turned 23 years old, it's unusual and you know that something is wrong. We then spent the next number of hours trying to figure out where was he, because we just knew that he was camping. We pretty quickly determined that he was at the music festival in the South, and Hirsch was there with his close friend, Anair Shapira. And there's a third friend, they're like a trio, who was out of the country. But when we heard about the festival, we asked the third friend if this is where they were, and he confirmed yes. And there was chaos the, all over the country. Um, we had friends come over immediately to spring into action, not to, not to just say hello and, and show support, but we went into action mode. And action mode on that first day was 
trying to figure out where Hirsch might be. Um, ultimately, uh, we were not able to locate him anywhere, and that includes having sent two friends down to different hospitals in the South to go through unidentified bodies. Um, fast forward a day, we had received a picture on the internet, my daughter had seen it, from inside of a bomb shelter in the South, and our friends quickly identified people who were in the picture and family members of theirs. And we ultimately, sometime on Sunday, day two, spoke to some witnesses who had been in the same bomb shelter as Hirsch and his friend Aner. And what we learned is they were at the music festival. As chaos broke out in the morning, they got in a car and started to escape to the, to the north, the direction where we live from the festival. The car came under gunfire on the road, like so many other cars on the road. They made a U-turn and went back south. Rockets were flying overhead, so they got out of the car and went into an above-ground bomb shelter. We learned from witnesses that there were 29 people in this five-foot by eight-foot bomb shelter. We learned that the shelter came under attack with grenades and that Hirsch's close friend, Anair Shapira, who was standing in the doorway, was able to intercept seven grenades in a row and toss them back out. Grenades have a four and a half second timeline before they detonate. Um, the eighth grenade we subsequently learned actually killed Anair, um, at which point three more grenades were thrown in and then gunmen came in and started to just shoot the room with bullets. We now know from these witnesses that of the 29, 18 were killed that morning. Four, including Hirsch, were taken hostage at gunpoint. And what the witnesses who were under dead bodies, but watching what happened, told us is that when Hirsch stood up at gunpoint to be taken out, is when they saw that his left arm had been blown off around the elbow. Um, so Hirsch and three other boys were taken hostage. We subsequently received a video of it after a strange set of circumstances and an interview a week later with Anderson Cooper on CNN who had received a video because he was working on a documentary of the music festival. And in the process of interviewing us and seeing pictures of Hirsch, he recognized him, said to us at the end of the interview, I'm calling you. And he did, which we thought was strange. And he said, now that I recognize Hirsch and the story, I, I can tell you that I have video of the abduction and I'm sending it to you. That's how we got the video that we have. Um, and... We know that Hirsch's last cell phone signal was inside of Gaza at 1025 in the morning. Since that time, we have had no interaction with Hirsch, no sightings of Hirsch, and basically no information. I was going to ask, Rachel, how have you been? It sounds like you, have, you haven't been getting any information about your son. How frustrating. I... How frustrating is it that you, Rachel and John, have not gotten any word, any information about Hirsch's well-being or his whereabouts? And why is that? Well, first of all, I think that um, part of what is involved when someone wants to terrorize you and traumatize you is they don't give you information. So um, when Hirsch and these, you know, initially it was 252 people who were taken hostage on October 7th. Um, they were such an interesting and varied compilation of human beings. These were people from 39 different countries. They ranged in age on the seventh from nine months old, a baby, Kfir Bibas, who was nine months old, who was kidnapped. And the oldest person was an 87 year old grandmother. And they were from all different walks of life and they were Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus. And so all these people just disappeared and no one was able to get information about any of their loved ones. And we desperately in the beginning were calling out to the Red Cross, begging, begging for anyone to give us information to go in and, and find out what they could. But to this day, day 181, I mean, 
with extreme exception, nobody knows anything about their loved ones. At the end of November, there was a release of, thankfully, many of the women and children and babies were released, but there are still people being held from 25 different nations, still representing those five different religions. Now, Kfir Bibas is 14 months old. And the oldest person is now 86 because the 87-year-old grandmother, thankfully, was released in November when 105 people were released. But we have 134 people that are still being held there. And when you're asking, you know, how frustrating is it? I don't even experience frustration. I am in the midst of an ongoing trauma. There's, it is... You know, most people in life have experienced normative trauma, you know, where you have a death of a loved one, a sudden death of a loved one, someone coming home and saying, honey, I want a divorce and you weren't expecting it, a child telling you something that's very hard for you to reconcile with, uh, you know, some something that you you feel strongly about. That's normative trauma and it's horrible. It's a metaphorical truck hitting you in the back. You didn't see it coming and you're now laying broken on the side of the road and the truck has driven away and everyone has to decide how do you begin to recover from this trauma? How do you begin to integrate it? How do you begin to sit up? When do you take your first step forward? And it's different for everyone. What we are experiencing, all of the hostage families is what's called ambiguous trauma. And the difference is the truck is still on our chest. So there's no moving forward. There's no integrating it. We are laying and trying desperately not to move the wrong way so that the truck doesn't crush our rib cage and kill us. And so we are living on a different planet. And I say every morning that we're putting on these costumes of humans and trying to run to the ends of the earth to save and to save the other hostages. And in order to do that, we can't do what we want to do. When I wake up in the morning, what I want to do is lay on the floor in a ball weeping because my only son, who I know because I've seen the video, is grievously injured. You know, Hirsch and I are both left-handed and it's his left arm that was spontaneously amputated by an explosive. I know he's in pain. I know he's suffering. And the only information that we do have is from the people who were released at the end of November. They did say that the hostages who were taken, especially early in the morning, and we know for a fact that Hirsch was taken in the hour of eight, that mm -hmm. they were taken for medical treatment when they first arrived in Gaza. And the working assumption of the intelligence community is that Hirsch did get some form of treatment on that first day. And I don't know if you've seen the video of him, but he is very composed in the video. I'm sure it's that he's dazed and in shock and in trauma, but he walks himself to the truck. He gets himself up on the truck. He doesn't lose consciousness. And the witnesses did say that he had fashioned some sort of bandage around his arm. And you can see in the truck, he is you see the jagged bone sticking out, but he's not bleeding. It, mm -hmm. Bleeding had stopped. So our working assumption and the assumption of, of all the officials is that he is alive. Um, tragically, we know that there are 36 hostages who are confirmed dead and their bodies are being held by Hamas. And we know that there are more hostages, that there is a suspicion a high suspicion that they are no longer alive and those families have been notified. So our um, intelligence officer has said to us, no news is good news. Every day that there's no news, it's actually considered good news. So we say hope is mandatory and we remain optimistic and we keep running. And every day it's a marathon. And as our friend Ruby Chen said, it's a marathon that you're sprinting through. And Ruby tragically got the confirmation that his 18 year old son Itai was uh, one of the hostages, the US citizens like Hirsch, who's a US citizen 
who was being held and they only got the confirmation that he is is dead about three weeks ago. So you are communicating with some government official uh, in terms of getting at least no information being good news. And, and tell me about that relationship the hostage families have with people within the Israeli government? Sure, so it, it took some time because the country was in such trauma on the 7th and for well, still, but trauma plus chaos for the first few weeks. But we were ultimately assigned a, a communication officer and what she does is check in regularly, makes sure that whatever needs we have that the government can step in and help with are being tended to. Um, and she is a conduit between us and the intelligence sources here. As Rachel said, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of intelligence, but we have this open channel of communication. Um, and like Rachel said, the days that we don't get notified by her are the comforting days because we have been told that no news is good news. Um, I will say, we are also blessed to be citizens of the United States. We are Israeli American citizens. And on the American side, we have gotten tremendous support and communication. We have open channels of communication with the Biden administration, with dozens of Congress people. Um, and that support has been really, really uh, tremendous. I will say in all of this that it's day 181. And as nice as it is to feel supported and hugged and to feel empathy, we want one result. And with every day that passes, it's more and more frustrating that we're not getting that one result. That's what we need right now. No more empathy, no more support. We want a result. And Rachel, how do you, do you achieve that result? Because I know the latest round of talks negotiating a temporary ceasefire and release of the hostages stalled once again in late March. When you all think of the path forward, the, the road to getting Hirsch home, what does it look like? Well, it looks very concerning because what we've had in these past 181 days is a crash course in geopolitics and sort of how the world works on a deeper level. You know, we had been blessed and privileged for all these years on this planet, thinking that things worked one way, and now we understand that they work a different way. And in many ways, we feel that certainly the hostages and the hostage families are pawns in a game um, that a few leaders are figuring out what interests are of the most value to them. And they're worried about those interests. And we would love for the leaders to actually be leading and leaning in and being courageous and being flexible and thinking about normal people. Um, and it is very frightening that there is leverage to be used. I am not certain. In fact, I would say I am certain that full leverage is not being used both in ways that are very seen and in ways that are unseen. And um, I know that sounds very, you know, <laughs> sneaky and and um, not so specific, but I, I think that, you know, there are five parties at the table, at the negotiating table, I don't know what happens in that closed room, but I think that we really are at a point where we know these hostages are dying by the day. We don't have time. There is a complete lack of perceived urgency, we think, by those negotiators. The fact that they go home at night shows that there's a lack of urgency. I, I get a feeling that if it was their daughter being held or their father or their spouse or brother or sister or son, that they might be putting some more energy into it. And um, 
we're very scared. We're very, very concerned. And, um, and we think that time is really running out. There have been protests I know in Israel and some of the hostage families have taken part where they are demanding the release of their loved ones, but also expressing anger and dissatisfaction with Benjamin Netanyahu and the way he is executing this war. Uh, I'm curious your feelings about that. And do you sympathize with those families? Are you aligned with what they're saying? So I would say a couple of things here. Number one is the experience of being a hostage family and having your loved one held somewhere for six months is such a frustrating, unimaginable experience that I don't judge any of the other families. However any family reacts to this traumatic experience, it's their right to react that way. So I don't fault people who are pro protesting. I don't fault people who are staying away from the protests. I will say that our standpoint is right now, we're not in the mode of saying we're pro BB, we're against BB. We want our loved ones to come home. And if BB could do it today, great. That would be the best outcome. If it's determined that he's not able to bring a deal and we need a new leader, a new government to get our loved ones home, we're for that. We're, we're, we're staying out of the political fray and we are staying focused on whoever can help us bring home Hirsch and the 133 other hostages. That's who we are supporting. But John, at some point, will there be a tipping point? You know, you say if he can bring Hirsch and the other hostages home, great. But at some point, as time moves on, and as you all have said, time is of the essence, and you worry that time is running out, at some point, will you say he's not getting the job done? We might, but I'll also point this out. We've been critical of the Israeli government at many points in the last 181 days for not bringing the results that we're looking for. But I'm going to be an equal opportunity critic here and say there are five parties who have been at the negotiating table for most of the last six months. And it's clear to me that none of the five is doing enough. What does that mean, doing enough? I'm going to call out a few. Qatar has an ability to influence Hamas. They fund them, they house their leadership, and they could do more to bring the result we want. Egypt is at the table. They have an ability to do more. And the United States has an ability to influence the other parties at the table. They've been pressuring Israel. That's okay, it's their prerogative. They could apply more pressure on these other parties as well. There are carrots and sticks that they could use diplomatically in all of these cases. And we want to see more of that because, as I said, day 181, it's time for our loved ones to come home right now. We feel like our loved ones, the hostage families, and so many other innocents in this region are pawns and are victims and are all losing to use the language of victory and loss. And we are not seeing any of the five parties doing enough. And the answer is going to be they are not doing enough until all the hostages come home. And in fact, you mentioned what's happening in Gaza and the other people who are suffering. And I don't think, sadly, so many people all over the world are seeing this in a binary way and not observing it with, you know, dialectically. Yes, and. And I'm curious for both of you, because so much attention, of course, has, I don't want to say shifted, but has focused in recent months, really, on the innocent people in Gaza who have been killed by this military action. And I, I'm just wondering how you square all of this suffering in your minds at the same time, Rachel? Well, you know, it's a great question that from early on, 
every single interview I did when I would say, I'm so worried about these hostages and I'm so worried about these innocent civilians in Gaza. And every single person who would be interviewing me would say, that's so interesting that you're saying that. And I kept thinking, why is it interesting? Like that is a very human response that I don't want to see people suffering. And, um, you know, Nick Kristoff wrote a great article at the very beginning of this conflict saying that if you only cry when one side's babies are pulled out of the rubble, then it means that your moral compass is broken and therefore your humanity is broken. And I believe that that was written on October 13th, if I'm not mistaken. And to this day, six months later, I am happy that my humanity is not broken. I am traumatized. I am filled with anxiety and angst and horror and trauma. But when I see innocent Gazan civilians suffering, it breaks my heart still. And when I think of my own son, who is also an innocent civilian now in Gaza, it also breaks my heart. And I don't have a problem. It's not, it for me, it's, it's not in conflict. I think that in any war, currently all over the world or in world history, we know that the people who suffer the most are always the innocent civilians who are caught up in a conflict. And that is exactly what's happening here. And I think that we have to be much more creative and insightful as people, as you know, the human species in figuring out how do we solve our problems so that it doesn't become this competition of pain and competition of tears. I just want to add one thing to that, which is I agree with everything Rachel just said. And I think that that balance is important. As time passes and the world focuses more on Israel's execution of this war, I do also want to make sure that what doesn't get lost here is that on the morning of October 7th, things were quiet in this region, and that quiet was broken with a massacre with a massacre of unprecedented in Israel proportions, which is over 1,200 people killed. By the way, over 40 of them are Americans. Um, 252 people taken again, from the 39 countries and all the diversity that Rachel talked about. And I don't think it's fair that it get lost in the shuffle that Israel had and still has some rights to respond. And I just want to make sure that, you know, Americans understand that if the equivalent in America happened, 40,000 Americans killed and 8,000 taken hostage into Omaha, Nebraska, America would respond. So I just, I, I don't like when that point gets lost within all the talk about how things have been executed. I mean, the irony but, you should know is that, you know, John and I have worked for 35 years in a coexistence paradigm framework in, in that community, in our lives. Hirsch grew up in that kind of environment. He has been involved for the last six years in a youth group program that brings together Arabs and Jews to try to demystify the other. And he right. is he's so pro-peace and, and involved in all these peace movements. And he has friends who are Palestinians. And well, so know, many of the victims, Rachel, were right. Yes. I mean, they were all, all the communities on, on the border there, those those kibbutz yeah. communities. I mean, that is the coexistence pro-peace composition of Israel. And now they're all either dead or being held hostage. It's such you a- know, It was very it, much- and, and I want to get us, I want to let you get us back onto topic, but I just want to say one more thing, which is there, I don't even know if they're still, if they're still big, but in the first couple of months, there were the kidnapped posters all over, including in New York City. And early on, a few weeks into the conflict, we were walking down the street of Manhattan and watched as somebody was pulling kidnapped posters, hostage posters, off of a sign in Manhattan. And as we got close to it, 
We saw what they were pulling down was the picture of Joshua Molel, a 22-year-old African Christian graduate student who was studying agriculture in Israel, and they were tearing down his poster. And we thought, if you want to pull down posters of Jewish Israelis, that's overly simplified, but okay. But you are so misguided if you're pulling down a picture of a poor Black African Christian student who was caught up innocently in the midst of all this and taken hostage. And by the way, we now subsequently learned that he was killed. And you should know that of the 134 hostages that are being held, you don't really hear anyone talking about the eight Muslim Arabs who are comprising part of the 134. You don't hear about the seven young men from Thailand who are Buddhists who are being held. You don't hear about the Nepalese. You don't hear about the Mexican. You don't, you know, there are, they're Catholic, they're Buddhist, they're Hindu, they're Muslim. You don't hear about that. What you hear about these 134 is you hear Jewish, you hear Israeli. And I think there's so much anti-Israel and anti-Semitic rhetoric going around that people have so little sympathy for that cohort. And it's such an injustice for so many reasons, but also I feel so badly for those families that they're not Israeli and they're not Jewish and their loved ones are there. Their children, their husbands, their fathers are there. How have you all felt as you've seen some of the anti-Semitism bubble up to the surface? I think that it is possible to criticize Israeli policy and not necessarily be anti-Semitic. Well, that's what, we that, do. Yes. that's what we do. Yes. <laughs> no, but but I will having say. said that, having said that, there has been an undeniable increase in just blatant out and out anti-Semitism. And as you all are enduring these horrific six months, I'm curious to hear your take on just witnessing this? It's just incredibly disturbing. And for 53 years, I have resisted using the anti-Semitism label. I just think that sometimes it gets overused. And unfortunately, based on what we're seeing now on university campuses in America, and some of the advocacy that we're seeing, um, it's just shocking. I mean, there is a terror organization recognized as such by the United States and most of the free world. And to see people not just being sensitive to the Palestinian cause, which we are also sensitive to and think that's fine, but to see that there are actually people who are walking around with signs favoring an identified terror organization in America, I don't know what to make of that, but it's a disturbing trend. John, you were talking about the negotiating parties. Have you expressed your frustration to the Biden administration about more that U.S. representatives could be doing to secure the release of the hostages? We have pushed them a little bit on their approach. Um, we are going to be back in Washington next week and we'll push them even more. Um, yes, we're going to continue to, 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 to question the path that they have been on. We don't question for a second their support, their empathy, their availability. Again, all of that is exemplary, incredible. Um, but we're going to continue to push them on their thinking, their strategy, their tactics. And we're going to do that until we get the result that we're looking for. We're in a world where there's no 50% success, 70% success. We're in a binary world. Either the mission that we're on succeeds and we bring home Hirsch and the other hostages soon, or we fail. And they just continue to die there one by one. And there's no scenario for anybody that... 134 coffins coming back at some point in the future can be success. And that includes the Biden administration. They don't want that. One of the things that we've appreciated is 
We meet with people across the political spectrum, both sides of the aisle. And what they always say to us is, this is not an issue of Republican or Democrat, left or right. We don't like when innocent people are being held, especially when they're holding Americans. And this is not a political issue. This is a human issue. And we're not going to stop until we get them home, which is great. That's the right way to talk about it. Now do it. You all are from Chicago originally. You lived in Richmond, Virginia. I'm from Virginia. And I know you moved your family to Israel when Hirsch was seven years old. Why did you want to move to Israel? So at some point I had said to John, he had said, you know, we're living in a time in Jewish history where there's a Jewish state. Wouldn't it be great to get on that ride and see what that is like if we're living in this moment in history where we have that option? And I came around to realizing if we don't try it now, when are we going to try it? And uh, actually, Hirsch had been born in Berkeley, California, and uh, that's where he gets his hippie, crunchy granola roots from. And then we moved when he was almost four to Virginia, and it was the summer before he turned eight that we moved. We said, OK, let's try it. Let's get on the ride of, of seeing what it's like to live in a Jewish country. And uh, we moved and uh, we've been there for the last 15 years. And we're part of that uh, adventure. And now, and you know, we're living in a time where it's a very dark chapter for this Jewish country and our people, and obviously for our family personally. And John, what has it been like prior to October 7th, living in Israel for you and your family? Yeah, I'd say it's been really good for us. When we moved there, our three kids were almost eight, five, and two. It's basically where they've grown up. There's never a dull moment there. Every day there is interesting. We've got an amazing group of friends, very diverse people from all over the world who have gravitated to Israel. Um, life there is not easy. It certainly doesn't lack complexity, but uh, we have had a really fulfilling 15 and a half years. And even in the midst of this hard time that we're going through right now, people say, do you regret moving there? We say we don't. We live a really rich life there. Given what has transpired in the last six months and given your philosophy of uh, caring about Palestinians and caring about the people of Israel, do you think it's possible to have a two-state solution or have you given up on that dream? Uh, I'll jump in. I, I think that right now is a challenging time to be talking about it, even though we have favored it for years. And the reason I say that is because there was this atrocity committed on October 7th and I'm struggling with connecting that atrocity to what could be perceived as a reward for it being a two-state solution. That being said, I don't think that Israelis are going anywhere. I don't think that Palestinians are going anywhere. So we could either choose the path of endless ongoing conflict where everybody loses, or we can choose a path that includes how do we live together? And I don't know if together is a two-state solution or it's something else, but we will not advocating, stop advocating for a path that recognizes that we're all living there. We all have to figure it out together. And that everyone deserves dignity and respect and freedom of movement and freedom of choice. And as John said, and we always say, no one's going anywhere. Let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. We have no other choice because this endless cycle of revenge, violence, pain, suffering, it doesn't serve either side at all. Is it going to be a two-state solution or something else? I don't know. But what I know is it can be different. 
It was not that long ago that Israel was regularly warring with Egypt. We now have a nearly 50-year enduring, pretty good peace agreement with them. We did something similar subsequently with Jordan. More recently, through the Abraham Accords, we have relationships now, productive ones, that involve business dealings, tourism, with other countries in the region. We have shown that it can be done. We just need to figure this out. I want to end this by bringing it back to Hirsch. If, if you were able to communicate with him somehow, some way, Rachel, what would you say to your only son? Well, what I say all day long, all the time, my mantra to him is, I love you, stay strong, survive. I love you, stay strong, survive. And I mean, it really just boils down to that. I, any parent listening to this, or if someone's not a parent, they can picture their own parent going through what we've been going through. And, you know, I live for the day that he will come home to us. And I know that it will be the best day of our lives for the rest of our lives, no matter whatever happens, the best day of our life will be when Hirsch comes home to us. So if he could be hearing this, stay strong and survive, you're coming home. We're never stopping. We're running to the ends of the earth and we will do whatever we have to do to get you back.